Ronnie. Fifty thousand people died in the city alone. A quarter of a million were killed during the civil war. And a million of our people sought refuge in neighboring countries, Ethiopia, uh, Yemen, Djibouti. That is the army fighting the civilians who had paid taxes to support the army. So the civilians were actually paying for the gun, guns and the ammunition that was used against them. If that's not genocide, I don't know what is. Voor de burgeroorlog woonden in Hargeza 500.000 mensen. Bij de gevechten in mei 88 vielen er meer dan 60.000 doden. De rest van de bevolking sloeg op de vlucht. In the, day, in the daylight, we are afraid of the bombing and killing. In the night times, all the night times, we are uh, building on the diapery and getting some water and some food all the night times. All the day times, we are just laying on for uh, uh, bombing of air attack and uh, heavy artillery. مال بخاره و بیعه مشتری این گفتی هر کی در مال ملتی ملبه دلیدی خوبی او این این they looted the food rations that the civilians had in their homes. They were surrounded and uh, uh, kept indoors for three days without food, without water. When the bombings continued, we uh, decided to go through Ethiopia, the nearest border we can reach. In this case, we are uh, started to work, to work on food and it takes for us about 12 days. On the road, you will always see the people, the elders, the Germans, women, all just playing each other on the road. And that's the world. As a refugee camp, how uh, a million refugees. There was Du'ad, there was Qaho, mm -hmm. and there was, where was the other one? Uh, the Hall, Abokar. There were f four or five refugee camps, each with over a hundred thousand uh, refugees. <laughs> Een van de meest onherwerkzame gebieden van het land. In juli 88 kwamen hier in een paar dagen tijd bijna een half miljoen vluchtelingen aan. De oorlog in Somalië bleef in het wereldnieuws maanden onopgemerkt. Maar het duurde dan ook lang voordat de hulpverlening hier op gang kwam. Het Hoge Commissariaat voor de Vluchtelingen stond voor de bijna hopeloze taak om in deze woestijn de vluchtelingen in leven te houden. Bargeza was voor de oorlog een welvarende stad. De vluchtelingen die hier vandaan kwamen zijn dan ook goed opgeleide vakkelaar, handelaren en intellectuelen. 
zonder enige van ons huidige bezittingen, moesten ze van de ene op de andere dag wennen aan een vluchtelingenbestaan. Uh, this is the, my family. Uh, this is my children, the wife, the sister of the wife. And uh, this, uh, my children, some of them are not here. And uh, uh, this is the fence I like with uh, my boys. And uh, this is the kitchen we cook. Uh, that's the kitchens of, of the family. And we also, this is the tent of the men and wives of the city. And that's uh, the present situation we have here. Uh, that's it. Somalische vluchtelingen zijn eigenlijk nooit nieuws geweest. Ruim drie jaar zitten ze nu al in dit kamp. Nog dagelijks komen er nieuwe bij. Vooral uit het zuiden van Somalië, waar troepen van de gevallen president Baar oorlog voeren met de nieuwe machthebbers. Iedereen moet zich in het kamp laten registreren. Alleen dan heb je recht op gerantsoneerd voedsel. When we can, uh, the refugee comes, especially in the Hashans, it's very strange for us. And for this like this, it's very strange. The thousands of people who was just crying and blind, waiting for uh, something to do. Uh, and there's no water, there's no home, there's no uh, anything. There's no tent, there's no home. There's no water, and I am very strange and wonder uh, it happens it is like this on my age. I don't expect it on this on this day. And it's still very difficult for us and wonder and it is I uh, told myself it's better to believe that we discuss. That is what I told my life on this situation. Yes, the Hashim Ibrahim was in Argesa a successful man. As manager of the luchthaven, had he a good salary, bediende and a big eigen house. The verwoesting of the stad verraste ook him and his gezin on the other. We lived a life where we earned a living, when we had uh, comfort, and it's strange for us to be somewhere where we have no food, no water, and we just don't know what to do. My children have been attending school since we became refugees. The character of my children have changed. They have become rebellious and they have resorted to petty crime.
They found the dwellings uh, littered with landmines because many of the houses had been uh, looted. The, you know, the, the army took corrugated iron roofs, the windows, the doors, and then left landmines behind to uh, blow up on the civilians if and when they would return to the cities. But my father's house had seven landmines in it when we returned to it. I can speak for one house, seven landmines. This is my house. This is the uh, bedroom. I have a second one here. found was 95% of the city was leveled to the ground. Uh, the streets were littered with dead corpses and human remains. And uh, one, of, one of the uh, uh, things that was most not noticeable was the number of dogs, because dogs had been living on the human carcasses. And they had never seen that many dogs living in the streets before in the city. That's the human carnage that took place. And the airplanes that caused the bombings took off from the airport of Hargeisa. It's as if planes took off from the airport in Brussels 
only to bomb the city of Brussels. They were, they were referred to as four minute sorties. It would take four minutes for the plane to take off, empty its holds on the city and land again. That's how close the target was. And for every sortie, the captains of those MiG fighters were paid $4,000. So the more sorties you made, the more $4,000 you earned and the more civil civilians you killed. Civilians who paid for your salary, who paid for the bombs, who paid for uh, for the army. Uh, such things happen from the humans. Very, very suffering. <laughs> Much more can come up with things that are such a such like this. The fighting can be happening, but such a destruction of the city. Never, never thinks. Never, nobody can think such things happen. The best situation is difficult to bear and think because what uh, uh, we are in survival for living only. Never thinking how to bear this now, but how to survive itself. Hier bij de is geen uitzondering. Hij en de andere teruggekeerde vluchtelingen staan voor de bijna onmogelijke taak hun huizen en stad weer op te bouwen. Ze voelen zich vergeten. De wereld is nauwelijks geïnteresseerd in dit deel van de wereld. Honderdduizenden verkiezen daarom nog steeds een verblijf in de vluchtelingenkamp, midden in de woestijn van Ethiopië. Daar is tenminste nog voedsel en water. Bovendien heeft het leven van het vorige regime in deze stad tot zo'n half miljoen mijnen neergelegd. Maar toch zijn er honderdduizend mensen teruggekeerd. Met een paar golfplaten op een uit het vluchtelingenkamp meegebrachte tent waar men op de plek waar ooit een woning stond. Twee dagen na hun aankomst had ook het gezin van Ibrahim in een van de vroegere kamers een onderkomen gevonden. Every country in the world received large influxes of refugees. They, there were waves and waves of refugees from Somaliland that came to your shores and you gave them shelter. You protected them from their own soldiers. You gave them food, you gave education to their children. Scandinavian countries, Britain, Canada, US, Arab countries, Arab Gulf countries, they ran from their own soldiers to you for shelter. And today the wave of Somalis who come to you come from Somalia because most Somalilanders have returned home. We are all returnees, the ministers and myself. We are all refugees who have returned from the world from anywhere, from elsewhere to go back to Somaliland to rebuild Somalia. <coughs> the waves of Somalis that you receive today are from Italian Somalia, La Somalia Italiana. And if they should if peace should not return to the Horn of Africa, and heaven forbid, should there be a war again between Somaliland and Somalia, you would receive more waves and waves of refugees coming from the Horn of Africa. And that's what we want to prevent. We want our people to re return, who have returned to that country, Somaliland, to remain in that country, to take part in the reconstruction, to rebuild the country, and show the world what Somalilands are made of. Somaliland today is a country where we have more children going to school. We have more schools, we have more hospitals, we have better roads, we have better businesses, we have better functioning airports than we ever had when we had a temporary union with La Somalia Italiana. Thank you very much. of Somalia. Um, 
before that incredibly Somali and twelfth former British colony on the continent of Africa to receive her independence. Uh, now Somaliland seeks her independence once more. I'm going to move. Oh, are you speaking next? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to move over to to Michael Greaves, who's really going to put on his Barristers wig um, and and speak very much about the legal case, uh, the very legal case, and the strong legal arguments for recognition of Somaliland. So, Michael, without further ado. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. There are very few bits of the earth left today that are not part of a country which has full international recognition. Uh, a seat at the United Nations and all that goes with the status of being a recognized state. Yet right in the middle of one of the most strategically important regions on, on this planet <coughs> sits this small country, Somaliland. And it's important is clear, given only a very clear, a quick glance at the map. It lies just to the north of its erstwhile partner in the failed union with Somalia. <clears throat> and we know quite a lot about that country. It's a country which Somalia has not functioned for the last 25 years as a state, but has been a state ruled by warlords and radical Islamists of al-Shabaab and the home to gangs of pirates that have played havoc with the passage of shipping along the Horn of Africa and down the east coast of the continent of Africa. On the other side of the water lies Yemen, and between the respective coasts of Yemen and Somaliland pass all, pretty much all the sea traffic using the vital Suez Canal route that <clears throat> runs between Southeast Asia and Australasia on the one hand and Europe and the east coast of the United States on the other. And 10% of that traffic can't use the Suez Canal because it's too big, so it has to go down the east coast of Africa and round the Cape route. It doesn't take much of a genius to realize just how vital those uh, waters are to the interests of the whole world. Not very far away is the Persian Gulf, and the importance of that seaway, again, needs no stressing by me. We all know exactly what it means to the West. It's a vital region. Yet since the dissolution of the Union with Somalia, Somaliland has remained hitherto completely unrecognized by the entire world. So uh, I want to just take a quick look at three things. Firstly, a little bit of history. Uh, then the issues, the legal issues that surround it, and then briefly look at the issue of recognition as it stands today. Uh, Somaliland came under British protection, and I'm going to start, and the Somalilands will forgive me for starting with the, Brit the arrival of the British uh, on the scene, because that's the best place to start. Established a protectorate in 1888, and it was garrisoned from Aden on the other side of the water and was effectively administered as part of British India, remarkably, until 1898. And then in due course became under the aegis of the colonial office. 1940, the Italians invade British Somaliland and it's the only campaign in which the Italians were victorious in World War II, uh, overrunning the protectorate in August 1940, annexing it to their empire. Uh, it was recovered by British forces in March 1941 and then was returned to British rule. After the end of the Second World War, it became obvious that British Somaliland, like all other African colonies and protectorates, would become independent sooner rather than later. And so the next 15 years were spent in preparation for that moment. Uh, one aspect of that which is particularly germane to this issue uh, it comes from the archives of the British government. A lot of the work that was being done by the colonial office at that time, between 1945 and 1960, details discussions and agreements between the UK on the one hand and the neighbours, uh, neighbouring states, Ethiopia, which uh, was independent, uh, France and Italy, which were the colonial powers for Djibouti on the north and Somalia on the south. Many of those discussions were designed to fix the international borders of Somaliland and you can see by going through the archive the process by which gradually agreements are made over individual bits of land so that by the time uh, the moment for independence comes up there is full agreement as to what the future borders of Somaliland and indeed of Somalia were going to be. It is well understood that uh, in due course when independence came for Somaliland that there was a desire to have a union with uh, all Somaliland, or sorry, all Somali uh, 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 nations, and uh, uh, in particular that it would seek union with uh, Italian Somaliland when it in turn became uh, independent. 
the UK archives again are revealing. Some show that the, that the UK was happy to encourage this uh, union to take place. But there is something of a thread in the archives of warnings being given that some thought ought to be given as to whether this really was such a good idea after all. Notwithstanding that, events came to a climax. On the 26th of June, British Somaliland became independent as a, uh, an international state. And no less than 35 other states in the world immediately signified their recognition of that fact. Their recognition of the government of Somaliland as both the de facto and de jure government of a new state. And implicit in that recognition, and this is very important, uh, they were accepting that Somaliland had the borders that had been agreed uh, uh, internationally. What then happens, uh, and we can describe this in hindsight as something of a legal and political shambles, uh, was the uh, creation of the union with Somalia. Uh, I'm going to go into some detail, and, and I'm sorry if it, 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 it's a little bit boring, but uh, one would strive manfully to avoid detail. But it's quite crucial to the legal case that Somaliland has. It had been agreed in advance between representatives of both Somaliland and Somalia that there would be in due course an act of union and that it would be signed by both states upon independence and that that document would be in the nature of an international agreement between two states. The Legislative Assembly of uh, Somaliland thus passed its own Union of Somaliland and Somalia law immediately upon independence on the 27th of June 1960. And in theory, it was immediately effective in Somaliland. But it was anticipated that that document would also be signed by representatives of Somalia. In fact, that never happened, because the Legislative, Legislative Assembly of Somalia met on the 30th of June, a day before its own independence, uh, uh, in order to consider what it was going to do. That body decided to approve, in principle, a completely different document in Italian, Atto di Unione, which was significantly different from the document that the Somalilanders had produced and passed in their legislative, legislative assembly. This new document uh, uh, requested the government of Somalia to establish with the government of Somaliland a definitive single text of the Act of Union to be submitted in due course to the National Assembly, that's of the new state, the new union, uh, for approval. Uh, that is important because it suggests that both uh, the Assembly in Somalia did not regard the Atto di Unione as being binding on Somaliland. It's difficult for us 50 years on to recall the enthusiasm and exuberance which predominated uh, events surrounding independence in Africa in the early 60s. They were heady days as old colonies emerged from their chrysalis as bright new butterflies every few months. So what then happened uh, it may be seen perhaps as practical politics taking over and law and, uh, uh, and so on getting swallowed, swallowed up in uh, idealistic enthusiasm. On the 1st of July, the members of the Somaliland Legislative Assembly and its Somalia equivalent met in a joint session and a constitution which had been drafted in Somalia was accepted on the basis of acclamation and the provisional president was elected. That was in pursuit of the draft constitution which required such a thing to happen. Almost the first thing this new elected provisional president did was issue a decree to formalize the union. In the event, that decree was never converted into law as it was required to do. Uh, and uh, if a, a, a decree was not passed into law, it in theory uh, ceased to have effect f from uh, ab initio, in other words, from the date of issue so that any decree, particularly a decree declaring a union, would have been word f a void from the word go. So there's a very strong argument for saying the act of formalization of the union was thus void. The other problem is that at this stage, there's, uh, as you will see, there's more than one version of a document floating around purporting to be an act of union. And any good lawyer will tell you that where there's a contract, if the, term, the terms of it must be broadly identical, at least in substance, if not in fact, or there's no contract. So there's a very, very strong case for asserting that the Union of Somaliland and Somalia law had no legal validity in the South Somalia, and the approval in principle of the Atto de Unione was insufficient to make it legally binding in that territory. So uh, what you have is uh, two documents, neither of which are uh, identical in terms,